Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Phelan, the online director of HBA, and you're very welcome to uh, today's webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, over the, the last couple of weeks, I suppose, uh, we've been doing everything online, as everybody has been around the world. But in terms of all the pitches that HBAN normally do to all the syndicates, be it Bill, Bloom, Eris, MedTech, West by Northwest, uh, Ulster, uh, am I missing anybody there? The forum, uh, they've all been run online with all the companies still pitching and actually getting quite a lot of attendance, which is great. Uh, my colleague Siobhan Killen has been organizing all these weekly seminars and we had a great one last week with Damon Carey from Techstars giving his view from London. The week before we had uh, Flynn O'Driscoll giving us their views and term sheets. Um, same rules as last week. Uh, we have a lot of people on the call today. If you do have a question, there's a Q&A function at the bottom. If you just uh, tap into that, we'll pick it up and we'll ask the guys the question. Today, the, the theme is investing during COVID-19, a view from the Valley. Uh, and this week we have uh, Paul Burfield from Enterprise Ireland San Francisco office and also Barry O'Brien, who is the head of strategic investments and Silicon Valley Bank Lyft. So two guys who are at the core uh, and the coal face of investing in early stage startups in, in the Valley. And we see a lot of stuff here, obviously, but it's really interesting to hear what's going on around the world and really interesting what Paul and Barry have to say. So. Without further ado, I'm just going to go over to Paul and Barry. Maybe the quickest and the easiest thing is for you guys to give us a quick uh, background to yourselves, where you're coming from, how you ended up where you are, and then we'll just go into what you're seeing globally, locally in the Valley. Paul, maybe go to you first. Sure. Well, thanks, John. Um, morning slash afternoon, everybody. Um, Paul Burfield, um, Head of Enterprise Island for the West Coast. Uh, been in the Valley since September 14 um, and um, moved here from Sydney in Australia where I was uh, running our Australian New Zealand offices for Enterprise Island and prior to that into the UK. Um, since September 14 I've been predominantly sort of focused on managing our investor relationships across the Valley and advising um, our portfolio companies and early stage Irish companies on um, how to raise money here or how to try and raise money here. Um, it's an intricate sort of uh, organization and system out here. So uh, we've seen a lot over the years in terms of investor sentiment and nothing more interesting than the last sort of month or six weeks. Hey everyone, I'm Barry O'Brien. I am um, from Lucan in Dublin. I arrived in San Francisco in 2008. Um, before I joined the bank, I was an officer in the foreign service and ended up being posted here as the deputy head of mission at the consulate. I did that for about four and a half years. And in that time, I came in contact with Silicon Valley Bank. And um, the government, through ISIF, ended up becoming a significant LP in SV Capital, which is the venture arm of the bank. Um, and they also decided, and I also ended up joining the bank, uh, where initially I ran what we, call our, what we call our corporate venture capital business. So our global relationships with the investment arms of the Fortune 500. So my big clients were like Google Ventures, Salesforce, BMW, Intel. Uh, and guys like that. Um, and then last year I transitioned out of that job and joined SV Capital, um, uh, where I'm the head of strategic investment and I'm also the head of a program called SV Lift, which is where we help emerging managers of so $150 million funds engage with LPs globally through the bank's network. Um, SV Capital is about 6 billion AUM, uh, predominantly fund of funds, about 80% of our money is in fund of funds. We are the significant LP in most of the brand name VCs that people would know, Sequoia, EDA, Andreessen, Greylock, Redpoint, uh, we're, we're, and then we're also the bank. For those of you who don't know much about Silicon Valley Bank, um, the bank is the bank of the innovation economy. Today we bank about 70% of all the VC in the United States, and we bank well over half all the VC-backed startups in the US. We're a commercial bank, we're not an investment bank, so our job is to sit in between those two worlds and try and help them meet each other and then grow value from there. Despite our name, we are a global bank. Um, we have 32 offices across the US, a full bank in Canada. We have over 200 people in London. Uh, I helped open an office in Dublin. We also have offices in Copenhagen. We have, a full, we have a full bank in Germany. We have offices in Israel. Um, and we're, uh, we have offices in India. And we're one of two American banks licensed to RMB and dollars operational in China. Uh, there's some phenomenal background for both of you. Thanks. Uh... 
sure between the macro view of the world that, that you see between all that stuff, but also the, the local uh, uh, practicalities of what's happening on the ground. Uh, just uh, to share those over the next 45, 60 minutes, that'd be great. So really looking forward to that. Um, I, I suppose just Paul, maybe on the global scale, what are you seeing at the moment? Yeah, um, globally, we're seeing um, a ridiculous use of the word unprecedented to start, and we'll probably use that a lot during this session um, to get that out there. But no question, we're entering um, a global recession. Um, world GDP will be down sort of 2% or slightly higher this year. Um, you know, it's from the US perspective, we'll be down somewhere between 35 to 4%. Uh, we've had 26 million people sign on for unemployment in the last four weeks, uh, which will translate to an unemployment rate across the U.S. of somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. Um, and across Bay Area tech companies alone, uh, there's been 20,000 furloughs or layoffs in the last four weeks across 200 companies. So, and we see this continuing. So, it's not a particularly rosy picture globally, um, and it's not a particularly rosy picture across the United States either. We got a very. I mean, you obviously you have a, a bigger macro view, having dealt with all those large uh, corporate VCs. Are, are you hearing anything that you can share with us there? Um, I think here here in the states, as a bank with the PPP program, it's been hard to think about anything else besides that. Recently, um, we did. We did Thank we, you for the benefit of everybody here, Barry. Do you want to just quickly explain what the PPP program is PPP, and what it does? Pay, pay, payment protection program, which is the U.S. federal government's basic rescue deal. So. When you hear that Donald Trump has signed executive orders for billions of dollars for the economy, how it actually arrives in American company hands is called the Payment Protection Program, which is administered through an agency called the SBA, the Small Business Association, uh, or administration rather, um, which wouldn't be entirely dissimilar to a much bigger US federal scale. Um, but basic, but we as a bank, we're not a particularly big bank, but we did 3,800 3, loans for 2.25 billion in 10 days. So it's- That's, it's, that's, that's reasonable size now, you know, Fred, Barry. <laughs> it, 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 it is federal government funds. Um, we didn't have that function in the bank, but we were accredited a lender for SBA. We hadn't done an SBA since 1993. So to use Paul's word of unprecedented, um, the word that we, that we keep hearing around the place is black swan. It's a black swan event. Um, but that, that function didn't exist in the bank. So we had to stand up that entire 200 person division in a, and, and do those loans in 10 days. And how, what's the average size loan going into it? What type of business? And were any of the, 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 I suppose, tech companies able to avail of that? Or was there only companies that have, were cash flow positive until this happened? Or was there any conditions around it? Or what were the conditions? You know, there was a number of conditions. The affiliate rule was one, of the, was one of the more concerning ones for us. The affiliate rule being that if, you're, if your organization had more than 500 employees, you likely couldn't apply. Um, and the way it was structured, that if you had an investor, like a VC, and they, in their portfolio is more than 500 employees, that would, that would exclude you. Uh, that was one to get around. Um, the, average, the average loan size is about, is about 70 grand, um, but there, you know, there are ones that are significantly larger. It depends on the size of the company. Um, and, you know, and, and it's also now, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of people in the call know this, but there's a lot of backlash against now in the States. Companies like Farm Girl, Farm Girl Flowers in Boston who didn't get it. And then you see big companies like Shake Shack and Roots Chris Steakhouse did get it. So there's a huge amount of inequality and in how the money's gone out. But like I say, when you're trying to pump out hundreds of billions of dollars in a matter of days, um, it's not always going to be a smooth process. And, and in terms of the impact, uh, I presume it's been positive compared to what the, the, the alternative would have been, is it? It's positive compared to the alternative being that companies would literally fold and shutter. I mean, like companies wouldn't have had enough runway being the BC word, but literally paying their employees, they would have had to stop doing that. I mean, the amount of furloughing that was significant. Um, but I mean, in terms of a longer term impact, you suddenly inject that much liquidity into a market, into an, into an economy that, to Paul's point, is stuttering badly. I mean, you know, you're going to see massive recession. Um, the longer term impact of it is, is, yet, is yet to be seen. And I suppose for both of you then, the, the, the massive recession that we're looking at, uh, I suppose the, I mean, we have a lot of people on this call who would, would typical profile is going to be an investor who would have a portfolio of companies. 
are those companies or how big an impact are those companies going to have trying to enter the states given that that's going to be their primary market what's the impact going to be like what sectors are going to be affected what sectors are going to do well out of this yeah look you know um pragmatically we always have a view that you know, d despite the current environment, um, there is still opportunity here. You know, it is becoming more narrow by and defined by sector, but it's still the world's largest economy. And for the majority of Irish companies, particularly our portfolio companies that are SMEs, um, you know, there are nine and ten zeros in the GDPs of every state of every region of this country. Uh, that still makes it a very attractive um, end market. Um, from from a sector perspective, um, you will be seeing the same thing we are. There are some there are some really hot focal areas around cyber, around wellness, around digital health, um, products aligned to 5G rollout. Um, that they go on cloud infrastructure, um, but where we're seeing um, uptick significantly, and it, it hasn't just been a short term trend. Uh, it's been the extension of a long term trend, particularly across cyber and security. As the number of workforces have gone remote in the last four to six weeks, uh, that migration has put enormous pressure on, on the um, security infrastructure of large corporates. Um, so, and we're fortunate that we've got a great portfolio of um, of cyber companies in Ireland. So, we're still bullish on that side. Um, downsides, you can imagine. You know, anything that's aligned with travel um, uh, is really going to struggle. Um, retail is in the same. Uh, so yeah, there's no shocks in that in terms of where you see surprises or not. On a practical level, are you seeing slowdowns? And you know, I'm seeing it myself in terms of you're seeing uh, engagement. The sales cycle is taking longer, if at all. The POs are taking longer to pay out. The, the payment cycles are getting longer. Are you guys seeing that? Or is it too early? No, definitely. You know, from from early days um, as target customers for Irish companies, our clients were focused on sending their workforces remote. You know, there was a natural delay in response in uh, progressing any conversations uh, and that has continued. So it, again, depending on the sector that you're looking into, uh, that sales cycle has predominantly extended or got really short uh, where there's you know, potentially some very fast demand for, um, for some areas of the, of the sectors that we're looking into. Um, but as a general sentiment, yeah, you know, buyers and prospects are taking longer to respond. Uh, they're not as amenable to new offers unless the value proposition absolutely resonates with the market that we're looking into right now. Very good. And Barry, are you seeing much of that? Or you know, it's, it's, you know talking to a number of the VCs I work with, many of whom are my friends, um, you're kind of seeing a lot of them. No one really prepared for, for what's going on. I mean, if we had if we had had a big SBA team sitting down in Arizona for the last since 1993, I'm sure our shareholders would ask us why do, why do you have that. Um, so when you talk to VCs and you talk about their portfolio, it's interesting. Kind of you, you can almost kind of split into three. One third is like badly affected by this, and you know, kind of having to be floated by the VC. You're looking at like kind of restructuring their debt, bridging things like that. Um, and then you have a middle third that's kind of fine and kind of, um, and then, and then you have another third that's kind of companies that you thought might've been in trouble. This is actually benefiting. And that, that's been an interesting thing to watch. I mean, even in the public markets, if you told someone six months ago, you're going to sell all your stock in IAG, BA to buy stock in Peloton, they would have thought you were a lunatic, but now you seem like a pretty smart guy. So, so you see, so, so it's hard. And even, even I look at my own, like I have a number of angel investments. Um, and I look at them myself, and one of them, I have two, I have two, three Irish angel investments. One of them is now completely basically shuttered, and the other one, it's a company that started in Sligo, and it's now it's now headquartered in Los Angeles, um, is is basically booming. They're, they they we're we're actually looking to find money to help them meet their sales their sales demand right now. Uh, what sector are they in? Uh, one is basically retail, it's ba retail, and the other is uh, is is sports, digital health, sports testing. Very good, very good. Uh, and at a, I suppose at a ground level in the valley, what's the sentiment? What, how long is this going to last? Or does anybody know? Or how long? One last more, piece of strength. Yeah, well, well, yeah one, one of the more sageful people in all this has been Bill Gates, in that until there's a vaccine and a viral to treat it, 
it's very hard to know how long it's going to last. It's like, yes, there's a V in just about everyone's portfolio right now, but how long that lasts until it's treatable is very hard to predict. And it's very hard to plan for. Um, like the idea of someone standing in Lansdowne Road next October, November, with 52,000 people who potentially have coronavirus is highly unlikely and kind of stupid. So, so nor- normality returning to the economy is hard to do until we have that. There's been some really interesting indicators. Yeah. Um, uh, Microsoft led with this and said they would not hold any external events or internal meetings of more than 50 people until July 2021. Um, Facebook jumped on that bandwagon. Um, so initially our thought was, uh, Microsoft, that's genius. You're just pushing everybody to your remote working platforms. Fair play, yeah, big call early. Um, but that sentiment is flowing through. Um, so. so we could see a couple of ways going here until we don't necessarily expect the majority of big tech across Bay Area to be, you know, back in the office, um, at least through the summer. Uh, in fact, the, the early sort of signpost from them is that they're not necessarily asking their workforces to come back if they don't feel comfortable at all. So they're, they're setting up for what is a new normality of this remote environment. Um, and that is going to downstream into some really interesting variables for product and service plays across new industries. Um, so it will be fascinating to look forward in the next sort of six to 12 months, really, um, and see how this plays out. Yeah. And in terms of deals, are you guys seeing any deals closing out? I mean, is there anything, any, what's the, what's the deal closure rate like at the moment or in the last six to 12 weeks? I brought a deal to my, to my investment committee yesterday. So we're definitely doing them. Okay. Uh, well, yes, it might be technology that or, or areas that are suddenly hotter than they were, and how people do things in the future is going to change. But they're definitely uh, are, deals are being done. I was going to say, are they bridging rounds just to keep keep no, the no, doors open, or are they actually investments no, for growth? No, this is this is a, this is a growth VC. I've done deals with before. Brought it, brought brought us into it. And I, I presented to the IC yesterday. Yesterday, so. But I think on the whole, like you know. VCs have been triaging their portfolios for the last four or five weeks um, and assessing sort of along the three lines that Barry outlined, you know, dead, you know, stable, and, you know, what do we do to pour fuel on this fire? Um, And that's, you know, they're starting to look up now. Um, You know, they are taking meetings, um, so they are sort of progressing conversations, um, but they're doing so through um, existing relationships. So, one of the things we see as being really difficult right now because venture investing is a contact sport uh, and it's based on relationships. And the first thing they're looking at is, is the strength of teams and founders to execute the vision and their business plan. Uh, and it's really hard to create that rapport, as good as this medium is, um, from cold. Uh, so our concern for some of our portfolio companies are looking to raise money here in the next three to six to 12 months that I've, from a standing start, it's going to be really difficult to build that sort of relationships if they don't exist already, or unless you are in that top 1%. That top 1% is always going to get funded. Um, it's the bottom sort of 80 that are going to struggle. Yeah, I mean, re- realistically, this has been going, like you look at the, a lot of the tech companies are reporting this week and shares are going up because Q1 to the end of, to the end of March wasn't that bad. Um, it, when, it's when we took account for April, now in May, San Francisco is in a shelter in place till May. We can't leave our home. We can't open our offices. Nothing until until, until June at the earliest now. Um, so Q two is going to be pretty bloody, I think. Um, and, and with that, I think that deals that were on the table are getting done now. But as this as to possible as this goes on, then suddenly you might start thinking, hmm, I may need to sit back because I do need to triage these bigger positions I already hold. So I don't know if I want to deploy more fresh capital. Also need to talk to my LPs because LPs are not being overly forthcoming right now. A lot of them are kind of also you know, where the VCs and the investors get their money are, are kind of sitting back and saying, let's see what happens. Um, so a lot of people are going to, I think, and the longer this uncertainty goes on, the more people are going to just sit back on their cash. It's not like 2008 where banks have you read out of money. There is, there, is, there is money. It's just people are not willing to put it out there right now. And in, terms of, in terms of startups, the bigger problem I would say is that the exit market's being closed. Like, yeah. you look at people like, like Airbnb and basically, you know, they pulled their IPO. Uh, and more and more companies like that that may be looking at an IPO uh, are, 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 are saying no. And then as we go forward towards autumn, winter, next spring, uh, companies are going to struggle. And will that create kind of a lot of turmoil and opportunity in the M&A market? So your eggs, so what you thought you might have been acquired for 
you know, look at like blue, blue jeans being acquired by Verizon. That wasn't a great outcome when you look at how much money went into that. Yeah. Uh, another company I know raised about 1.48 billion in venture. The chances of that, and they're looking, they were looking to exit. The chance of getting anywhere near a good outcome on that is highly is, is highly unlikely right now, based on the sector they're in and the product they sell. Um, so I think as it goes on, the exit market is going to become where you might see more damage. Yeah, but presumably the multiples are going to be affected on, on yeah. the outward side. Sorry, Paul, you were going to say something there? No, I was just going to, uh, just going to sort of back up Barry's point there. It's a fascinating time here because there, there is an enormous amount of money in the Valley. You know, there's, there's $120 billion in dry, uh, dry powder sitting in venture funds, which is a record. Uh, now, about half of that is reserved for follow-on rounds in earlier funds. So, so there, is, there is still an enormous amount of capital that, that may or may not be deployed um, in fresh rounds going forward. Uh, so we're not seeing the end of venture investing in the Valley, but there will be a massive twist to it. Yeah, so we're, we, we, we're, in the, we're in the process of closing our 10th fund of funds, which will be about a billion dollars. And it will, get, it will get done. But how it's deployed may change. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, on the ground, what we saw here is when this all kicked off, we, we had a pipeline. And what we saw off that was about 20% got closed as expected, primarily because the legals had already been pretty much done. Everybody had committed the capital, that was it, gone. Uh, then we saw about 30% where there was an immediate sort of, right, let's review the terms here, let's, let's push down the, the value or push down the amount of capital going in. And then the other 50% was, was at that stage of getting the investment where uh, everything hadn't been committed and everything else. So they're still at risk um, and they're still, they're ongoing. And they, a lot of them will close out, some of them will fall off, that's normal enough. But uh, certainly, I think the risk has got, got, got more uh, the longer it goes on. I suspect that's something similar to what you guys are saying, really. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I suppose, um, on, on the upside, um, I mean, the M&A side sounds like that's going to going to be carnage over the next 12 months. Um, well, corporates are sitting on a lot of cash still, yeah. you know. Like say, Q1 has not been bad for any of the tech companies. Google's up at 8% this morning, so, um, so they're, so they're going to have they're going to have the cash to come and see what they want. They're going to be able to shop because people are going to need exits. They're going to need liquidity, and their opportunities are going to be a lot. Like the public market is basically closed. I would say for the next couple of months. And the corporate venturing arms, are they going to contract, do you think? That was sort of one of the thoughts that might happen because that's the first thing to go. No, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, in 2018, one in five rounds of this case was led by a corporate, which was, which was different to make the, people always say corporates are going to go away because that's what happened in 2000. But I think, do you think in 2000, Google was a two-year-old company? Um, so it's a very different thing. Um, and why they were developing corporate VC arms like Amazon just sold books. Now they said now literally most of us are living through Amazon. Um, but good corporates, there's about 10 or 12 incredibly good corporates. We're all using Zoom right now. Uh, that was funded by Qualcomm's venture arm. Uh, they returned a massive amount of money off it. Um, and I think that if you look at how CVCs have evolved over the last while, the talent they've brought in, um, like Salesforce is led by a guy who came from Battery, um, and also corporate guys are going into the, like someone like Wes Chan who came from Google Ventures and now Polices. Um, so that, that human capital is, far, is, 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 is much better than it was a decade or two ago. And how they, and their behavior is more aligned with traditional VCs uh, to the point where, where traditional VCs will often look to bring corporates into a growth round. Because when that company does start to scale and you have the scale of someone like Qualcomm to deploy it on, that's going to that's gonna make your, that's gonna increase your value an awful lot more than the check for a million or two. Yeah, no, very good. Um, I suppose on the upside for companies that are possibly growing, is there much talent uh, available now? Is there a lot more available? Yeah, um, uh, from the outset, I mentioned that big tech has dropped off furlough at about 20,000 employees. So, so yes, you know, talent, um, you know, there has been a, a massive demand for talent in, across the valley in recent years. Um, and it's become incredibly expensive. You know, when you've got first year computer science grants coming out and being paid 180 grand, you, you know, you've got a problem. Um, so, so that that market will will start to free up. Um, and, you know, the advice we're providing companies is if you're in a good position and you can afford it, then, then grab it. Um, so yeah, that dynamic will change. Pretty good. Um, 
I see we have a question just here. If just bear with me for a second. So it's an oldie but a goldie. In what circumstances do U.S. funds, banks invest in non-U.S. resident companies? And then, uh, uh, in all caps, really. <laughs> any any <laughs> sort of thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the the U.S. I mean, U.S. VC, I mean, VC in general is controlled by the LPA, the Limited Partner Agreement. Uh, the Limited Partner Agreement often will preclude you from investing outside of this jurisdiction, for the logic being that if you have 90% of your fund invested in the US and you put a smaller amount of it outside of the US, venture is risky. 60% is going to fail on a good, on a good fund regardless. Uh, but if you have to then go into a foreign jurisdiction, a foreign tax jurisdiction, and a foreign currency to try and recover or recuperate, that adds up right, OPEX to the fund that you necessarily don't need. And particularly if things go wrong and you are trying to recover, it becomes a headache you don't need. So unless the LPA is structured for such that it will invest outside the US, it's not that the VC doesn't want to do it. Oftentimes I've brought deals to VCs who, who would love to do it, who think it's a great deal. But if it's headquartered in, in, in Ireland or France or Spain or wherever it might be, they're just not allowed to. So, so what's the way around that? Do, do you set up a subsidiary in Delaware or something and you do it like that? Is that the easiest? Yeah, you call Paul to the eye and help and he'll help us out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And, and from our uh, perspective of positioning um, Irish tech companies to venture investors across the valley over the last few years, um, my, bet, my message back to our companies is you just don't realize how hard it is to get money out of that channel. Um, it just has to look perfect. Um, and one of the more interesting stats I've seen um, in recent weeks was something that was released by Pitchbook uh, last week. Uh, that detailed the median distance between uh, the lead investor and the target company at early stage across California was 90 miles. Yeah. And that's, that was up from 60 miles. So they're, they're looking further afield by 30 miles, but that's the length of the valley, right? So um, it, it, we, we keep coming back to this old adage that if, if you're not here, you're not here. Uh, and, and for Irish companies that are looking to raise money from US investors, which we think is a, a very appropriate strategy at sort of Series A onwards, uh, flipping up into Delaware Seas is, is, is a very appropriate um, action to take and one that is absolutely required if you're gonna get money from a traditional venture firm. Uh, we've historically uh, liked uh, the corporate ventures and the strategic guys because they have a different investment thesis that they are quite happy to write checks into European companies um, and not require those sorts of um, Delaware Sea structures. Uh, but, you know, the word that defines this place is it, de it depends, you know. Um, That's how sexy it is. And then in terms of Paul, I mean, just you get everybody coming at you from, from here all the time. What's your advice in terms of what stage do they need to be at? How much momentum do they need to have behind them? What kind of traction in the market? What size, what turnover, monthlies, ARRs, annual ARRs? What's the profile of company that you're saying? If you don't have this, just don't come here. Yeah, so I mean, firstly, shout out to our own organization and, and structure in Ireland who are you know, exceedingly good at deploying small amounts of early stage capital into, uh, into Irish startups. Um, the great so stuff, I, and ju just, just a heads up there as well, they also fund or co-fund h band so yeah, you right. are doing great yeah. work. <laughs> so we're into trade, yeah. and I and I. And I. <laughs> yeah. I got a load in there. <laughs> yeah, and it's not, it's not a you know, hugely parochial view, it is my genuine view that Enterprise Island is, is instrumental in supporting early stage startups in Ireland, um, and I would, I would always be pushing any company that's coming to us at pre-seed level to go back to Ireland and talk to us and yourselves and other early stage investors um, and not attempt to raise seed capital outside of Ireland or certainly not from the Valley, and unless there is something just super exclusive about them. Um, at Series A, um, you know, my own view is if the United States is a key target market for you, which it generally is, and it is one in which you can achieve genuine scale without leaving its borders, um, then raising smart money from, from the US, particularly the West Coast, is an appropriate play. Um, the difficulty at that point is there's 25 to 30,000 startup companies in the Valley who are all targeting the 3,000 VCs and the 1,500 corporate venture arms, and you just have to look perfect. So uh, a lot of our advice and direction back to that portfolio is, is on messaging and debt preparation and structure so that you don't make an error in that first approach. 
um, because our objective is to get you in front of those investors and not them have them look at a deck that's a mess and kind of go, I, I, no, yeah, next. Because they just Hard don't work. need the deal flow. And I suppose, given the fact that we have so many investors on this call who have portfolios, uh, what would you recommend to them in terms of their portfolio companies? When should they start looking out if going out to the valley? Uh, it, it's never too early to start engaging investors on your plans. Um, so as early, you know, earlier the better, um, because to my earlier point, it's, it's, it's as much a relationship game as, as it is, you know, the, the value proposition resonate. You know, that has to happen. That's, that's table stakes. Um, but the more you can engage um, the ecosystem out here as early as possible, um, bring them on the journey with you is, is smart play. Um, very good. Um, Barry, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd absolutely agree, Paul. Um, a, a guy I know back home, Bobby Healy, he's, he's a good entrepreneur. He has a car trotter, he now has mana. Uh, and I, I've known Bobby a while, and Bobby was very smart. He started looking for contacts out here to come out and meet them and talk to them, see them, go to the, be at the right events, be at the right things. And that's a very smart way of doing it. And Bill, because Paul's earlier called it, this is a contact sport. I mean, it is. It's, it's not like public markets. It's all private markets, private information. You think about it, like I always say, the cheapest thing a VC can give you is their money, because that's what they have to give you. That's kind of why they're in the equation. It's what does that VC bring on top of that? What doors can they open? What phone can they pick up? Who can they talk to? Where can they get you? That's the real value of the VC that you pick. Um, and also I've found sometimes with Irish entrepreneurs coming out here, doing their, doing their homework a little bit better. Like the commanders, I want to meet Sequoia. And you're like, why? Because they're the biggest. Yeah, but who in Sequoia is going, to look at, is going to look at you? Who over there is going to invest in you? Even also, so many banks, 70% of this economy, when we look at the attribution of a fund, we don't just look at the attribution of Sequoia, we break it down by partner, we'll break it down by venture partner, we'll see what their attribution is. We'll watch that, we watch those numbers. Um, so it's picking the right fit and doing that homework. But Paul's point is spot on about seed is, if you can't get the seed money in Ireland, you're probably not gonna get it out here. Yeah, and, and it's something that we say to everybody, we hear it all the time, we'll just go to the valley and get the money. We said, listen, you can do that, you're back here in 12 months' time, and you'll have achieved and nothing. And the other point is, if you're, at, if you're a seed stage company and you're going to come out here, that's the cost of coming out here is prohibitive. Rent here is still over, well over three grand a month for a one bed apartment. Yeah. As opposed to, again, you know, things are not cheap here. So you're going to burn whatever little bit of capital you have on a fishing trip that you're probably not coming back for anything with. Yeah, so uh, it's how to do it smart. Yeah. And do your <laughs> homework. But well, just um, Barry's point there is bang on in terms of one of the things we cover more about our relationships with venture investors here is less about their money because we know how difficult that is to obtain and it's all about their knowledge. Um, you know, the average partner is looking at somewhere between two and 5,000 deals a year and is investing in less than 1% of those. There is nothing they don't know about the dynamics of the drive the verticals of which they're putting money into and that is super valuable information for any of our early stage companies uh, to test out what their value proposition is and where they're trying to place it so um yeah we, we love that ecosystem for for their knowledge as much as their cash excellent i've just got a couple of more questions here um <laughs> do startups want to see trump or biden post november uh, you don't have to answer that one um <laughs> How is the investment behavior of Silicon Valley business angels changing in the crisis and are they responding differently to the VCs? Is there a different culture there? I think that if you look at angels more broadly, the, the public markets have tanked so bad here that their personal liquidity positions have taken a hit in the last month or two that oftentimes you may have sold a public position to invest in a private position. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not possible right now. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, have, has the angel behavior changed? Uh, yeah, they're not really, I'm not seeing, not, I'm not seeing too many, like I'm not, normally you kind of get phone calls from a guy, you know, saying, hey, look, there's a deal here, do you want to look at it with me? I've had one of those phone calls in about five or six weeks. Okay. Yeah, angels are interesting. I think over the, over the last couple of years, um, we saw the angel, angels and angel networks start to lift their eyes outside of um, the US to get in earlier to better quality deals, um, which we were a bit excited about that we might, we might be able to create some early stage collaboration um, with some of the angel networks here. Um, we haven't had any sort of 
feedback to that in the last sort of four to six weeks, I think, you know, I think Barry's right. Um, a lot of those guys are going to sit back and um, take a different view on their positions. Very good. Um, is there any other advice you give to the investors here from what you're saying, like just practical advice to help their companies? I mean, the co if the companies are putting their staff at the furlough, that's fine. We have different me mechanisms here. We are here helping a lot of companies. The, the revenue and the government have done quite a good few different initiatives. Is there anything that people can do on a practical level? Um, if I start on that, you know, I guess the, the metrics that investors are looking at for their early stage companies here, if they're in a relatively stable position, is, is 12 to 18 months of cash burn on balance sheet to ride out this cycle. Um, so, you know, what do you need to do to get there? It, it will be a combination of, you know, refining teams, furloughing, cutting, you know, 50% hours, whatever that needs to be. Um, but preserve the business to fight another day um, yeah. uh, through just retaining cash on balance sheet, um, finding a way to source that. Be alive. Be alive. Yeah, this side of the grass always helps, right? Yeah, but, but also, you know, we're absolutely still leaning into building relationships. You cannot take your eyes off business development. You've got to be out talking to customers, talking to prospects, maybe refining your message in terms of a lot of what we're doing with Irish companies now who are not in aggressive sales positions, but you still need to build on relationships. So it's, it's more around what can I do to help you, Mr. Customer, at this time frame, as opposed to how do I get a check off you? Um, so there's some pivots in messaging. There's potentially some pivots in value proposition to get into some of the faster flowing lanes of, of where the sectors are at the minute through you know, a line to this. Um, but stay alive through cash management. Yeah. Very good. I see we have a, we have a question here from uh, Ronan Dunn in, in Verizon. So it's a it's a uh, self self uh, related uh, question. Uh, I think Ronan's actually based in New York. But uh, the question is, how interested are investors in the value in five G related opportunities? And if they are, is the tech itself or the new cases it enables? I can I can. I, I can talk about one of Ronan's good friends, one of, one of his favorites, Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm Ventures have just set aside, set aside uh, Ronan knows uh, my, my former boss very well. Um, they, uh, they, Qualcomm have just set aside basically, Mollenkopf set aside an entire 500, basically the return from, from this, from Zoom, brought a lot of money into Qualcomm Ventures, that they've set that aside purely for 5G investing, so that they become, so you look tactically in the States, uh, Huawei is basically not allowed to come here because for a number of national security reasons. So Qualcomm's basically making a huge grab for that and they're leading the charge in 5G. And you're seeing a number of, of other VCs following them. Um, and it, in terms of the use case, the use case is kind of more what I hear them talking about, looking at 5G particularly in healthcare, uh, remote surgery, things like elective surgeries, things like that. Teledoc, I mean, Teledoc Health is, is absolutely booming on the public market right now. That, that, was, that was invested by a couple of guys I know. Um, so that that'll be my kind of my thoughts on that one. Yeah, right. it's a great question because um, that's that's one of the sectors that that we're leaning into right now is it's robust. You know, um, the five G deployment across the carriers is still invested to spend or expected to spend something like mid forty billion dollars this year to upgrade that ecosystem, um, and a lot of it is wireless antennas and sort of the last mile of connectivity in regional areas and the services that overlay that. So. When we're um, looking at some of our companies like um, Tower Glass and um, uh, Alpha Wireless, you know these guys are, are doing well, and um, you know that's an exciting area for this for us this year. Excellent, um, and, and we, we know both companies well, so uh, good to hear they're doing great out there. Yeah. Uh, I have another question here, and it's, it's from John Collins, who who is in the travel sector himself, uh, so he's a. Uh, is travel tech mobility specifically high risk or good opportunity at the moment? Um, is that one of those, it depends? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of like some of the travel tech stocks right now in terms of their, their valuations. Um, <laughs> um, IAG at sub 200 has got to be a buy. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, from an investment perspective, it's it's hard to look at that sector 
with a degree of excitement unless you're looking at something that's highly discounted. Um, yeah, I don't know, Barry, any thoughts on that? Still I'm quite a bit metal. Yeah, yeah, cheers, catch the old hospital pass there. Um, <laughs> I mean, you look at Airbnb, they pull their IPO, the model is, it's not like the model of the business is broken. If, you, if we could travel right now, if this, if this, if this pandemic wasn't happening, I would say that most people would still probably stay in there. They're going to Barcelona, they're going to, they're going to Vienna, they're going to New York. They probably would still stay in an Airbnb. They're not going to go, I won't take Airbnb's product. The product is not broken. The access to the product, that, that, is, that, is, the, that is the inhibitor. Um, so, you know, and, and, and as, soon as, as soon as we're told we can travel again, it's probably going to be like Pamplona, whatever in heaven's air. For the bullfight. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you know, we're all going to want to go everywhere. Make every, you know, oh, I can't wait to get here. Make everyone you talk to, I can't wait to go on a holiday. I can't, everybody you talk to, I can't wait to go, you know, down to Spain, right, to Hawaii, or wherever it is. So I think that travel tech right now, there's probably some really good bargains around there because, because no one will touch it. But I mean, it's not like we're never going to travel again. So you might, you might buy in now. It might be a pretty bumpy ride for a while. You may have to look at your investment system for a bit. But longer term, the chances of me not staying in an Airbnb is pretty remote. Yeah, but I mean, if you invest now, it, it might just be a case of cash flow in the business till yeah. it all comes back. Yeah. Uh, but the valuation you get now makes up for the fact of what you've just done for the next 12 months. So it, it, they all depend, right? Yeah, and look, the TSA had their highest number of scans through US airports yesterday, um, at, you know, prior to the end of March. So you, you, could, you can start to see some green shoots. Um, and the, the, Barry's right, the, the user sentiment is, is there. We can't wait to get out and start doing it again. So, you know, if there is a sector that might V shape and its recovery that could be one. I mean, one, one thing that I think would be interesting here in the States, if, if we're in lockdown now until June, if that goes on, the idea of Americans being locked up for the 4th of July <laughs> will be a very interesting thing to watch. And, you know, yeah, I'd like to see it up in uh, Michigan there. <laughs> like, you know, to your, to your, you know, the lakes in Michigan, that kind of stuff. I mean, to your earlier uh, question about is it Trump or Biden, right now, I still, I'd say it's a coin toss between them. Yeah. Um, you know, people think, oh, you know, everyone, but I mean, you go to a lot of, like, I, I got a master's degree at a university in Indiana, and you go, and you, like, that's, that's the heart, that's what, where Mike Pence was governor, that's the heartland of America, states like that. People, you know, those kind of MAGA principles are still pretty strong. And if you yeah. start, you know, keeping them locked up for the 4th of July in states like Michigan, that's going to be an interesting time in the states. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, this conversation could go really wrong, <laughs> so I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose, I mean, this in the, the, the November uh, uh, presidential elections is going to feed into all of this as well in terms of the economy, in terms of how much cash is going to be, liquidity is going to be pumped into the economy to keep the small businesses going, keep people employed. Is there a sense that there's going to be more cash deployed? No, I, yeah, no, sorry. Um, look, you know, when you look over the last few weeks, you know what what the market has has looked for is is sentiment um, from both the Fed and um, some sense of where this virus is going. Um, the Fed has come out very strongly, saying that we will do whatever it takes to get this economy back on track, which has been received very positively by markets. Uh, the virus has taken some twists and turns, but there is, and we don't know where that's going, but there, there is a sense that you know, we might be coming out the right side of this. Um, and and I, that's why markets have started to recover in the last week and we've seen some upticks. Um, I think if either of those two things start to reverse, I, if, if we don't continue to get strong sentiment from the Fed, that there, there will be coming iterations of tranches, you know, that'll spook markets. And if, and if the virus does something different, um, we see a, a number of reinfections and we go back into lockdown, then that will do the same. So really hard to tell. Barry, do you have any thoughts on that or, or similar sentiments? In, in terms of November specifically or? Yeah, just in terms of between, between now and November, I mean, I presume Trump's yeah. going to uh, look for a, a, a pump more cash in just to 
give a bump to his like the, the, the PPP program we were talking about earlier, um, they, Mnuchin just announced a second wave of that coming in of the 320 billion. Um, what that does for inflation and things is going to be hard to tell. Um, so, but this president doesn't have an operating economy. It's basically a strong, it's the strongest suit he has, so he needs it. He's an Republican, he's everything, all that. Um, you look at companies like Ford announced a $2 billion loss in Q1, um, you know, big American manufacturer. But when you go to somewhere like Detroit and you see that the supply chain of that company, it's all the smaller companies around Detroit and cities like Lansing where you saw all those, in those, uh, all those, uh, all those protests or South Bend in Indiana uh, that are supplying them and they're dependent on those companies. So if companies like Ford keep losing money, the, those, and those supplier companies start shutting down, that's, that's the MAGA voter base. And if they haven't got jobs, because I think people don't, don't always think about because we're looking where we grew up is that if you lose your job in the States, you don't have, you don't have healthcare. So in a health pandemic, not having healthcare becomes a major, major issue. So I'm pumping all this money in to keep these companies artificially alive. They don't. Then have all these people suddenly getting sick who I don't have any healthcare for. It's, it's, on the macro level, it's, it's a difficult challenge. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you get rid of Obamacare. Uh, we won't go down that road either, lads. <laughs> um, I'm just, I have a couple of notes here. Just Martin Cass uh, from Barclays, just talking about Stripe raising another 600 million. So obviously some sectors are, are, are reasonably uh, insulated. Health tech, uh, health tech obviously is going well, but FinTech seems to be doing okay. Is that general thoughts? Yeah. I, th- I, th- I think areas of FinTech, um, you know, Visa also hasn't closed their deal buying Plaid. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's areas around it. Amex took a beat and their stock is coming back. Um, that, that Stripe deal, we're, we're, we have a big multifaceted partnership with Stripe and that deal was done kind of before a lot of this, a lot of this started to kick off. And, and, and that kind of insight is always really interesting to hear the reality of the stories rather than what you always read in the papers. So it's good to, it's good, it's good to hear that. So somebody's asked about uh, are VCs interested in data analytics companies? I'm assuming the answer is yes, and it depends what the sector. But a lot of good VCs came from that world. Um, yeah. You know, look at someone like Reid Hoffman, like Greylock, founded LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely, he'd be interested in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we're in that sort of correlation with fintech. A lot of our data and analytics companies are, are targeting financial services. Um, and they're, they're getting good runway uh, in conversations with that. So, yeah, big data and data analytics companies are, are, are positive. AI has been tracking up in terms of def- uh, deal flow for a year uh, and will continue to do so. Uh, digital health, very strong. Um, although difficult, you know, very difficult to disrupt that ecosystem. Um, but, um, yeah, still very positive. I have a question here from Faye walsh Driard. Um <laughs> She, she's uh, uh, apologising because she can't ha- hide her impact bias. Is there, um, are there any sense that any of the investments are shifting towards social environmental impacts, or is there any any sort of thoughts on that? Um, I'm not personally seeing that. Um, but if, if I flex on social into sort of wellness, um, if we're going that far into social, yeah, absolutely. Um, where they're, you know, as again, as a result of workforces um, being shifted to remote, uh, there there has been a significant um, investment in by large corporates to invest in their staff's um, mental health and well-being. So, so that's downstreaming into into tech companies that offer um, solutions in that in that space. But um, that's as far as we've looked. Yeah, I think that oftentimes people think like social and they think it's almost like a philanthropic thing, but like the deal, the deal that I, that someone earlier that I presented um, could be seen as a social good. It's, 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 an impo- it's, it's, sir, it's centered around employment for people who don't necessarily have great access to employment opportunities. Um, so think, so yeah, I mean, we are, we are seeing more and more of that. Paul's very spot on with talking about kind of labor force movements, um, remote, you know, this, this whole experience has shown us maybe you can work from Zoom more than you thought you'd, you'd want to. It does work here. This technology is getting better. The ability to share information is getting better. If you know, look at 
Microsoft, like people like Microsoft basically trying to compete with people like Slack, et cetera, bringing out Teams, these, these kind of technologies has made our, our ability to do these things a lot easier. Um, also creates, you know, secure, that also brings a lot of security into the issue, particularly for someone like us who works in a bank. Um, so you're seeing an opportunity there too, but it depends on, uh, to, to answer the lady's question, so how do you define what is a social impact investment? Yeah, I, I, I suppose there's many different shades on that. Um, but ultimately, I think, and to be fair, uh, Faye, we've always said it has to be the double impact at least or treble, tre yeah. double, double bottom line or treble bottom line. Yeah, the, the other in terms of social that we've seen, we've, we've, we've dipped our tone a bit is education technology. Okay. And education accessibility um, these, and th these kinds of things. So because that, if, that, if that is, I, I would consider that in a social impact, but um, yeah. But, and also to Paul's point about kind of, you look at investments like CAM, um, you know, your mental health, companies buying that more and more for, for their employees, taking care of it. Like a, big, a big thing for us as a company is looking at our employees. We have three, just over 3,000 employees now, and we're all suddenly working remotely, which puts huge strain on the, com on a, on, on, on the business, on the company. We're not designed to do this. We're not meant to do this in terms of how we've been conditioned to work. So what does that do for our employees' mental well, our mental welfare? You know, they're all, none of their kids' schools are open, so now they're at home homeschooling them. They're looking at their childcare issues. How do we, what can we do to help that? And we are looking at more and more technologies that can assist with that. Yeah, and those kind of things throw up huge opportunities as well. Yeah. So I think, and I think there's gonna be new opportunities coming down the track in the next six, nine, 12 months as, as that new normal sets in. It's, it's gonna be a really fascinating time, I think. On, on the flip side, John, actually, like we've seen it across the Bay Area, um, the emergence of smaller funds operating in niche areas, and, and social is one of those. Um, you know, female entrepreneurship is another, and you know, marginal communities is another. There's a whole heap of these now. They're all small cap funds, um, and it's conceivable to you know suggest that their access to capital is going to be placed under um, higher pressure throughout the next um, three to six months where some of those may not survive, where, you know, it's, it's great to be investing socially, but does this value proposition stand up to market scrutiny and is it going to scale and all of those typical things? So uh, the swings and roundabouts in that as well, I think. Very good. Listen, guys, thanks for answering that. Is there any last sort of bits of advice you might uh, give to the investors here in Ireland or Europe? Very interesting stuff. Thank you, smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Paul's point earlier, the question about kind of, you know, building that, there's only one Irish VC firm off an office and talking about it. I think it's a bridge. It's yeah. something really interesting that you have a lot of kind of potential for Series A type investment in Ireland, but then if you want an exit, your company has to grow and scale. And to Paul's point with this being a, a contact sport, if you don't have those, those contacts personally, you're not here every day. It's hard to do. So, you know, coming over here, talking to the, how, how do you graduate your investments up the food chain to exit? How do you grow your plants? Yeah. Uh, it's something that I think needs to be, sometimes I think when I'm back home and work with different people, needs to be given more consideration. So, so it sounds like, I mean, a lot of guys, a lot of people are, are jumping straight to the exit strategy in terms of right, well, who, who's the targets that, that might acquire the company as we get there? But actually, to get to the, the the size where you're an acquisition target, that that that's probably a little fuzzier, I suspect. And we probably need to do a bit more homework. Going back to your uh, analogy, Barry, um, that's probably a good way of doing it. Um, okay. so on the pos on the positive, Jonathan, like you know, our ecosystem in Ireland has never been stronger. Like we are spinning out more high quality startups than we ever had before, and that is being recognised. Uh, not only here in the US, but across Europe. So, you know, deal flow is still potentially strong. Um, the necessity to curate that for current market conditions is, is probably what's on the front of mind uh, for early stage investors across Europe and particularly Ireland right now. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's, there's good and bad in this, in this cycle. Yeah, I suppose what we saw, I mean, last year, uh, just for both of you and for everybody else listening, we had... 66 deals were done by the, the HBAN network throughout the island of Ireland, so that includes yeah. Ulster. Um, but 17 million went into those 66 deals, and on top of that, another 34 million went in. So there's so over 50 million went into 60 plus deals. So you're getting into reasonable amounts of capital, even by US standards, by what we see in the US groups. So 
yeah, it's it's becoming a lot more sophisticated. Um, and hopefully, this this is going to be a V shape and come straight back out of it and be a narrow. Um, but I think unless there's anything else that you guys want to add, I'm just going to wrap this up and say thank you both for your time and your insights. It's really useful and and, and enjoyable to hear what's going on in the valley. Um, so big thanks to thanks thanks to Paul Barfield and Barry O'Brien. Thank you both. Um, next week, folks, we have. Colin Heenan, who is the chair of the MedTech Syndicate out in Galway, he's going to be uh, speaking with Julian uh, Seymour just around MedTech investments in 2020 and beyond. Obviously, the MedTech Syndicate do, do a lot of the MedTech uh, deals in Ireland along with Iris. Um, and then just a big thanks to Siobhan for arranging today and arranging this call, Paul and Barry. So, listen, folks, thank you very much, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye bye.